Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited for the session. And before we start, I just wanted to introduce myself. So my name is Cherry Mendoza, and I'm from the Dubai Future Foundation. So I'm part of the Area 2071 team. And for those of you who ha uh, who's attending the session for the first time, or who haven't seen, haven't heard about Area 2071, just to give you a brief. So Area 2071 is an initiative, an initiative by Dubai Future Foundation, and it's uh, purposely designed to deeply connect the government, the startups, the corporations, as well as other stakeholders like investors, the academia, the youth, and the public to co-create the future. And this is inspired by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum's quote, which is, the future belongs to those who can imagine it, design it, and execute it. And today, um, the session is entitled, Putting Art 2 in 2020, Decentralizing Finance, tokenization and money legos and if you're wondering what two means so basically the session is hosted in celebration of the two years anniversary of the Dubai blockchain center which is one of the core partner of and before i hand over the microphone uh, to dr marwan i just wanted to inform the attendees if you have any uh, any questions during the session feel free to submit your question in the q a button at the and the speakers will try and answer these questions after the session. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marwan, the CEO of the Bi Blockchain Center. And have a great session. Thank you, thank you, Cherry. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. And uh, uh, so uh, congratulations to everyone who is a part of the Dubai Blockchain Center on the two year anniversary. You've been a great part of this journey and uh, we appreciate every single one of you. And um, uh, we just wanted to have the session to bring you up to date with the latest uh, uh, technologies and uh, update you basically on what is happening within the space of, of uh, digital assets, especially when it comes to uh, uh, blockchain uh, you know, um, technology, especially uh, what is uh, the, the latest buzz and what is the latest uh, you know, development in this space. Uh, and also we wanted to bring you up to date with the latest announcements that we have. So we have recently uh, signed up uh, uh, with uh, Blockchain for Europe. We signed basically an MOU with them. And we have uh, Robert who just joined us uh, and he's going to talk about what they are and what they do and how do they tie up with us here and uh, to buy for our Blockchain Center. Thank you, Marvin, uh, for the intro. Uh, congratulations, by the way, to your two-year anniversary. Uh, I know you did a great job so far, and I hope you keep doing it. And uh, one of the reasons why we are glad to have you on board uh, as a partner of Blockchain for Europe is because you're basically the, the platform uh, in the Middle East uh, dealing with these issues, which are very relevant and forward-looking. And um, we're trying to do something similar at the European level, more policy-focused, Though, as you know, the European Union is quite a complex place when it comes to policy, a bit uh, more than probably uh, the UAE. And uh, we're trying to do our best, uh, you know, to bring people together from the ecosystem at European level, uh, not mentioning uh, just only European players, but, you know, like global players from Asia, the Middle East, North America, and, uh, and wherever uh, they have an interest in European regulation. Uh, the, one of the premises uh, we're working on uh, is basically educating policymakers about the true nature of blockchain, which is still, uh, even after uh, eight, nine years, quite an endeavor because people still mix up uh, topics like Bitcoin with blockchain or think of it in a different way, cannot uh, differentiate between proof of work, proof of stake, what a crypto asset. So there's still, still a lot of uh, education work to be done. And uh, it's great that you do that as well in the Middle East, and that's why we're also glad to have you there. And uh, another issue on top of that is once you know people understand what the actual substance is uh, when it comes to blockchain, uh, ranging from you know stable coins, crypto assets, DeFi, um, and so on, name it. Uh, there needs to be uh, smart rules in place to not hamper innovation, which is uh, the main driver of uh, the whole initiative. Uh, behind blockchain and 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 expand uh, you know out of the financial services space into uh, all sectors and and take those use cases and and, and learn from them and uh, the regulatory bit uh, that we're working on currently is very financial services focused as it's still the front runner in this space 
So like uh, the European Union is currently working on a framework for crypto assets where we try to support the European Commission and all the people involved on the European ground to, to better understand and do the right thing to be technology neutral, nimble, ideally have a sandbox approach to, to regulation to let uh, the innovation that is possible and that you already showcased, for example, in Dubai, outline uh, on a European level and make the European Union or Europe as a whole like the front run in the space. And as a last point, uh, to achieve that, we also have a, a number of events we organize every year. Uh, so next week we start a webinar series on the future of the digital euro and how this could look like from a retail perspective. And uh, next year again, we will have our annual summit where we try to bring together again uh, global leaders uh, from around the globe to discuss a proper uh, innov innovation friendly regulation for the ecosystem. And that's in a nutshell what we do. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to send me a mail or, 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 or ask during the panel. I'm happy to answer anything if, if there's any question. That's from my side. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Robert. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited actually to work with you guys to, to bridge uh, this gap between the UAE and Europe when it comes to regulations uh, around crypto assets. I think you guys are much uh, ahead of us, but we are much more adventurous, I would say, <laughs> well, because you have you know a lot of European jurisdictions that you have to abide by. We have we are more agile in moving with these uh, uh, you know uh, digital assets, which is considered a new technology. As you said, uh, financial tech is the most promising for this technology, but at the same time, it is uh, the most challenging because traditionally people are not very open to new technologies because they are always take this risk approach and a conservative approach because of issues with KYC, AML, and uh, other aspects of, of the technology. But with that being said, I think that's a good segue for Ian. Uh, Ian is going to talk about a very new topic within this finance uh, sector, and uh, it is something that will definitely disrupt the lending market and other markets when it comes to uh, financing SMEs and financing small projects. Uh, and it could be scalable as well, and that's why this could be a very interesting topic. Uh, without further ado, uh, Jan, you can take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Do uh, Dr. Marwan. I, um, I, it's an honor to be here. Uh, a pleasure to be here at, the, at an anniversary presentation. It's amazing. Um, and it's, I'm glad to see that uh, everything is continuing through this uh, COVID uh, scenario and the lockdowns and all the meetings are happening. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. Just give me a moment. Um, okay. Can everyone see the first slide? So then, I'm just going to... Okay. All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanted to just say a few words to introduce... Uh, the context of this talk, um, uh, I'm, uh, this talk is, uh, presents my own personal opinion, and I'm going to read what's at the bottom of the slide for you and just explain it a little bit. These are my views, which you see here. I've been in this space since 2016, uh, beginning with uh, the Global Blockchain Council, and have developed a certain body of knowledge, which I'm going to present to you a, a little glimpse of it. Um, it's basically things that I've been able to learn over the years, and, and hopefully it'll give you a start um, on uh, exploring this on your own. Um, any mention that I make of specific tokens isn't an endorsement of these tokens. It's not investment advice. The concepts that I described in this talk, if, if I talk about deposits or loans, these deal with real money, okay? And when used, there are real risks of losses, uh, fraud, carelessness by you or others, or software errors in the blockchain uh, and smart contracts. Um, these are all real risks, and you need to be aware of them if you want to experiment with this stuff. Um, handling of tokens, furthermore, as Dr. Marwan mentioned, um, in inappropriate situations may be illegal. So for example, if uh, there's facilitation of money laundering, um, or terrorist financing. This is real stuff. People do go to jail for, for using this stuff improperly. It's outside of the banks and there may not be the same kind of controls that you're used to with your bank that kind of keeps everything safe. Um, please be aware that things on the blockchain are generally traceable. 
um, and uh, you should be a good citizen. Um, so, and lastly, I'm exploring these for educational purposes for you. And if you choose to do any of this stuff, it is at your own risk. And please keep in mind that things happen in this all the time. This is a very quickly innovating space. A lot of this stuff is experimental. Hacks do happen. Funds do get lost for different reasons, whether it's from malice or from carelessness. Um, it's it, please be uh, be aware of the risks as you play with this stuff okay if you if you're learning all right moving on so what are we going to cover today we're going to cover what i call blockchain 201 um which is i'm assuming everybody's seen the uh blockchain talks about all the hashes and links between blocks i'm going to leave all that out and just focus on some core concepts of a blockchain that helps you to think and to understand what blockchains really do, um, trying to boil it down to the very essence. Then we're gonna move into smart contracts and talk about what do they actually do? Um, people talk that it, say that it's computer code and that people, uh, people or organizations can, uh, can make contracts with each other and um, that this is somehow, it's, it, it disintermediates. What does that actually mean? Because databases and cloud computing do this stuff. So what do smart contracts do? So I'll get into that. And then when you have these basics in mind, we'll get into the de decentralized finance and decentralized finance is putting it all together, okay? And the term, the operative term actually that, that goes around the web right now is money Legos and you'll see why that is. Okay. Blockchain. First of all, let's start with security. Um, I can't sample the audience, so I'm going to I'm going to pretend that you guys uh, are responding or not. <laughs> um, there, in blockchains and security uh, in blockchains, there are two types of security that um, that are used. And um, when you think about this, uh, I'd like you to think about it for a moment. What kinds of security, uh, digital security, are available in a blockchain? And I'll say that there are two. There's one old and one new. And first of all, the old one, it's public key cryptography. This is the private and public keys that you hear about. This stuff has been around since the 70s. There are several different algorithms to do this. I'm assuming you know um, how this works with the private key being secret and the public key being a publicly uh, visible address. Uh, public key cryptography actually has two use cases. In, um, uh, if you look in Wikipedia, uh, and they're separate, okay? And these often get confused, so I wanted to clear this up just so that everybody understands um, what we're speaking about when we talk about this concept. Encryption, everybody talks about encryption with private and public keys. Encryption is not, not used in base, in Bitcoin, for example. It does get used in some types of blockchains. However, it is not required for blockchains to work. Encryption means um, changing a message so that it is unreadable by a third party. It can only be read by, some, by someone who uh, possesses a, uh, a key to decrypt the message. This is not used in blockchains. What is used in blockchains is the second use case, and if you check Wikipedia, it's a separate use case, it's cryptographic signatures. You still use the private and public key pair, um, but uh, in this case, you do not encrypt the message. It's always visible, and you're just signing, which means now after a message, something is signed, it's possible to verify that the owner of the signature has signed it, so somebody who uh, is associated with the public key has control of the private key that's associated with it and they've used it to sign the message. Okay, and the message is plain text, it's not encrypted. Okay, so encryption and cryptographic signatures are two different things. Blockchain use cryptographic signatures. So that's the that's the old type of security. And you know it's still modern and you use it for your banks. Second type of security is proof of work. Okay, proof of work is new, new because it was invented in the 90s for a different purpose than blockchains. Proof of work is the other type of security that gives uh, that is used in blockchains. I'm not going to get into proof of stake. That's a very deep and nuanced discussion. Um, I'll just focus on proof of work. It's, it's advanced enough as it is. 
Um, what proof of work lets us do is it lets us secure the transaction order. This has to do with the immutability uh, of, that you hear about in blockchains. Um, and the immutability that we care about is that transactions don't change in order. And now you'll notice that I don't mention, um, uh, I don't mention um, uh, uh, protocols for, uh, for consensus, consensus protocols. There really, in proof of work, there really isn't a consensus protocol. It's actually a workaround. Um, if somebody performs that, cryptographic puzzle and sets a transaction order and proposes a block, all you need to do is verify that that person spent a lot of energy creating the block and assume that nobody else is going to be, say, wasteful enough to do another one. Okay, and that's the 51% attack option that you might have heard about. But basically, proof of work makes it very difficult to change the transaction order. That's all that is. Um, it makes it energy intensive. There's no real consensus or talking or mingling uh, that happens to make that consensus, just whoever's first. Um, it, you can prove that it was difficult to set this transaction order, it's set, that's blockchain security. Cryptographic signatures and very difficult to change transaction order. So now in a blockchain, if we have transaction order, we can do, uh, and we have history, the transaction, uh, the transaction history and signatures, we can assign ownership of things to others. Say I have one coin, I can say, Jan signs over this one coin to Dr. Merwan, and I cryptographically sign it, and it's set in history immutably. Um, and now it's Dr. Merwan's to, to, uh, to use. That makes it a digital bearer asset, okay? So only those two things, and these are tokens that you, everybody talks about. It's cryptographic signatures to sign over control and a history that's very difficult to change. That's it, okay? This is why tokens are interesting because we can assign ownership to someone and then that someone has the ownership and the history keeps, keeps track of who has what. And digital bear assets are really powerful. Okay, so now we're into tokens. So what are tokens? Well, the first type of token that you'll deal with is um, what might be called a natural token, or sometimes people call them native tokens. Another name that's given to them is protocol tokens. Now, these are the ones that everybody calls traditionally cryptocurrencies, and they're, they have names like Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Monero, Zcash. Um, these tokens, um, they had the, it was the most difficult for folks to understand. Uh, why are they worth something? Why are they, um, what do, does their value represent? Well, their value um, is, their value is, uh, stems from the blockchain itself. And I'll get to that in a second. So these types of blockchains, sorry, these types of tokens, um, how are they created? Uh, the natural tokens are created permissionlessly through mining and they secure the order of transactions. So it's something that's important to remember. These natural tokens, they're necessary for the blockchain to perform its function of providing us the order of transactions, the history, okay? And these natural tokens are native to the public permissionless blockchains that manufacture their own security. These blockchains pay for their own security using these tokens, okay? So the Bitcoin blockchain pays Bitcoin to the miners for their service of making it very difficult to change the history of transactions, okay? Why are these valuable? Well, they derive their value from some uh, properties like durability. They're durable, meaning they don't, they, they're, they're consistent over time. They're portable. You can carry them around. They're very light. They're divisible. A Bitcoin divides into 100 million pieces. They're uniform. One Bitcoin is equal to another Bitcoin. One ether is equal to another ether. They're scarce, only 21 million or only a certain issue. Uh, they can't be produced um, haphazardly by anybody. They're transferable, we can assign it to somebody else and they are acceptable by many people across the world. Now, if you recognize these properties um, or if you Google them ever, you will recognize that they actually are the properties of something we call money. Okay, that doesn't mean it's currency, 
it means it's money. Currency uh, usually is something that's uh, a legal form of payment, which may or may not be true depending on the country that you're in. And currencies are also used to pay taxes. Okay, so money isn't necessarily currency. Currency is money. Okay, the other type of token is a synthetic token. So what's a synthetic token? Well, um, an example is Ripple, Tether, Binance Coin, MakerDAI, uh, Digix DAO, basic attention token, you'll recognize these. These are synthetic. Why are they synthetic? Well, they're issued in a discretionary way. They're not, they don't have a, a rigid issue that's uh, freely available by mining. They're actually issued by an entity, okay? By some, somebody who, who set a rule and that rule can be usually changed by that someone. And they don't have their own security. They borrow security. Synthetic tokens borrow security that's either provided by an entity or a blockchain, okay? So if, if, if these tokens are encoded in a smart contract, the blockchain that they're on will be securing uh, that nothing changes. If it's a private blockchain or a, or a, um, a security token, for example, um, the party in control of issue of these tokens, they're actually supplying the security. So what's the supply? How many, how many Ripple are issued? How many... Um, how many basic attention tokens are issued. This is controlled by some entity. Okay, so synthetic tokens come in two types. One is, um, and those types are, uh, they've emerged based on the application of these tokens. So people have been constructing them in, in, in smart ways. And one of the ways, one of the, 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 the roles of a synthetic token can be as an investment security. Okay. Investment securities are basically um, uh, financial products that are meant to appreciate over time. You're meant to uh, be able to make money on them or lose money. Uh, and then there are commodity or currency backed tokens, which represent um, um, either currencies or, or commodity assets. Okay, so investment securities. What are those? What are those types of tokens? They're the utility and security tokens that you will you will find. Um, they're meant to appreciate. The commodity or currency backed tokens, they may be backed by gold, they may be backed by dollars. They're commonly these days called stable coins. So these things are not supposed to appreciate. Their value is supposed to converge to some underlying asset uh, that these coins are, are pegged to, whether it's, a, it's an ounce of gold or it's a dollar or something else. Okay. So that's it, we've done tokens. Smart contracts, okay, so now we've understood what tokens are, we understand that, um, that blockchains, proper permissionless blockchains, they require tokens to be able to provide the security that they have. Um, we understand that nobody really provides, the miners provide the security, the, the miners can be anonymous and rewarded with the tokens. Um, what do smart contracts do, okay? They're pieces of code. Um, well, they're more than pieces of code, and, and, and here's what they are. Um, they're pieces of code that, first of all, are open for inspection. Since they're on a blockchain, they can't be modified, so anybody who reads them can depend that what they see is written is what will actually get executed. Um, now, here's the, the key one, okay? So we know that the code executes well, but the real innovation in, in uh, code on blockchains or in smart contracts on blockchains is that interactions that these smart contracts participate in, they are the actors in transactions. So if I use a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain, let's just say it's an ICO or maybe it's a loan or maybe I'm doing a swap with someone, I don't interact with the other party I talk and transact with the smart contract. The smart contract is an actor, okay? And that's the thing that often gets forgotten and hidden and misinterpreted. Um, it's what makes a smart contract powerful. It gives it all its power. If you take that away, um, it just becomes a piece of code that could run on the database. So if the smart contract is an actor and I interact with it and not other users. This is what disintermediation means. 
I don't need to, if I'm going to buy a car from someone and we're going to transfer ownership of a car and I'm going to pay them and then the ownership is going to go to me, I don't interact with them to do the car. I interact with the escrow. I give my money to the escrow. The other person gives the um, ownership of the car to the escrow. And then the escrow service makes a decision on releasing the funds to the seller and uh, releasing the car to me. This is how uh, this intermediation works. The parties speak with the smart contract. They don't speak with each other. So smart contracts, if you, you must have heard about that they, they find out about the world through something called oracles. They're just also a type of user or actor that can give them information. Um, they control their own balance. Okay, in order for them to do something useful and for their autonomy to be powerful, they need to have their own balance um, of tokens. So, um, so this is what makes a smart contract able to be an escrow holder. It needs to maintain its own, manage its own funds so that it has a public address, but there's no private key that, um, uh, that controls these funds and no one can move the funds unless the smart contract allows it. Okay. Give them back to someone. Well, it has happened to certain people. You might research the, the parity hack. Um, um, for example, uh, Jan, I need to, uh, Jan, yes? uh, can you repeat the last sentence? You were breaking up in the last slide. Uh, sure. Um, I have a cat that's meowing here. Just give me a moment. I'm going to let the cat out. <laughs> okay. While, while the cat meows, I will answer some questions. So somebody was asking, uh, what does the mining process do? Does it only provide the utility of issuing new coins? And the answer is uh, not really. There's two things that the mining uh, results in. And correct me if I'm wrong, Diane. Uh, one of them is basically the issuance of new currency. So uh, uh, they call this stock and and what else? I forgot the name. <laughs> so stock and flow. So they stock provide the flow. yeah stock to flow. Sorry, stock to flow means w issuing new currencies basically. Just like I was talking about the having yesterday or last week. Sorry. Um, uh, to issue new currency, you use mining. So whoever solves the, the, the block basically gets rewarded with the mining reward, which is 6.25 6 right now. Uh, and also it actually provides verification of all the transactions that happened within that block. So it's twofold, not only the issuance of new currencies, but also the, the um, um, uh, verification of transactions. Correct. Um, so it, uh, to, if, if I were to reduce to the most basic reason for mining, it is to supply security to the blockchain. The reason the miners uh, fight for those 6.25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes is that, uh, or the way that they fight for it, is by making it very by making blocks that are very difficult to forge to to for someone else to fake and kind of and present another block that's equally valid. Okay, so it's a race. Whoever wins the race gets to give them basically grant themselves six point two five Bitcoin, and that's what they make money. And if you look at who's on the other side of the transaction, who's paying six point two five? Well, the blockchain is paying six point two five by inflating the money supply a little bit. There's paying 6.25 for obtaining the next block, which is very difficult to modify, which is immutable, okay, uh, to simplify things. So the blockchain is paying for immutability. The, the miners are providing immutability and they're getting paid for it in these tokens. It's, it's very much a business transaction. There's value going both ways. It, it's not just a lottery, okay? There's a purpose to mining and it's security. Okay. You can continue. So um, when we're working with, uh, with smart contracts, uh, they can accept payments and they can, uh, they can also issue synthetic tokens. Okay. And now there are trust, trusted intermediary. 
what are examples of uh, smart contract standards that we might know and recognize? Well, you must have heard about ERC-20. Uh, these are the, the ICO boom was based on smart contracts that uh, speak the language or, uh, that are coded according to the ERC-20 standard. Uh, basic attention token, the stablecoin DAI, the stablecoin USDC, those are ERC-20 tokens. ERC-721 is another smart contract standard. This one uh, is for individual, because ERC-20 is for fungible, meaning interchangeable tokens. Um, ERC-721 is for unique tokens. So one, there's only one of each. Uh, and CryptoKitties, which you see here, is an example of ERC-721 uh, types of tokens. And they're issued by a seven, an ERC-721 compliant smart contract. Okay, another type of uh, smart contract that we might see out there in the wild are called DAOs. DAOs are decentralized autonomous organizations. Imagine a smart contract, it can hold money, it can have some logic. How about we code it like a company with shares and whoever has tokens that are issued by the smart contract gets a vote in decisions that the smart contract makes. So if you research MakerDAO, which is the issuer smart contract for the DAI stablecoin, this is actually a, a governance token. So the MKR token that's associated with it is a governance token. Digit, Digix DAO, which you, you, you might also have seen um, for managing uh, uh, gold tokens, gold-backed uh, tokens, that's also a DAO. And there's something new called LAO, Legal Autonomous Organization. So what somebody did is they linked a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain to an actual company incorporated in Delaware in the US. And the tokens of the LAO are real shares that get to act or vote on the actions of a real legal entity that's incorporated in Delaware. Okay, so this is already linked to the real world. It's an interesting read what these guys are doing. Um, investing in the Lao is actually restricted to only accredited investors above a certain amount. So it's not like a retail thing like the ICOs were. It's a serious project. Okay, so now you have the basics. You know what tokens exist. You know that they're natural tokens. You know that they're synthetic tokens. Um, that are managed by smart contracts or and, and or by entities. Um, you know that smart contracts own can handle funds and because of that they become intermediaries. They are very powerful intermediaries because they're predictable. And now think about this. What if smart contracts could talk to each other? Can they? Well, there's nothing stopping them from doing that. And what and people ended up with a name for that and they call it money lego so these smart contracts they manage money and they, if, if we make them talk to each other we can put them together like legos so that's what decentralized finance is and that's what money legos are so now a very short introduction um i'll finish that with some uh recommended reading for you guys okay so the pioneers of the decentralized finance space, if you want to read about the key projects, and I'll describe them shortly for you here, um, and very very briefly, sorry, for you here, um, and a I'll expand a little bit on the last one. So first, Maker. This is one of the most revolutionary projects out there. Maker issues a token that's meant to cost one dollar, and the way it does it is it. It issues it against collateral. So you would, uh, a user, anyone, can take a maker smart contract. They can deposit tokens into an Ether or BAT these days. Um, they deposit these tokens in there. The smart contract locks these tokens and issues them, uh, the user, a certain number of DAI tokens, which are meant to be worth one dollar and that user may use these tokens for transactions and then after a certain while they they repay the the loan the the, the dollars back into the smart contract and the smart contract releases the collateral if you look at how the maker um it's it's actually a complex product it's a complex set of um of smart contracts they are essentially performing the function of a 
I think you could call it a decentral bank. It's a, it's a bank that issues dollars, but any user of it that has collateral may, may issue their own dollars. Okay, so it's a very powerful idea. I won't get into the details of how it works here. It is actually a little bit of a, a, um, um, a difficult uh, set of concepts to go through. Another groundbreaking product uh, or project is Uniswap. Uniswap is a smart contract that um, acts as an exchange. Um, it has a, uh, a, a balance of the types of tokens that can be exchanged on the Uniswap smart contract. And you, as a user, can always give the smart contract some of one token and receive of it a certain amount of another token. And Uniswap actually has a very clever mechanism inside it that sets the price based on the number of tokens that are actually in deposit. Um, you'll be able to read about this later. I'll also give you, give you some reading on this app. Um, next. Um, oh, uh, okay, so uh, next is Compound. I'm, I'm seeing somebody in the chat saying uh, Slocket uh, used to do something called the DAO. Yes, the DAO was the initial DAO that uh, was a big fiasco in 2016. Um, I also had fun with the DAO and learned about this, and this was an aha moment for me. Um, uh, that was something that was, uh, well, it's another, it's, it's the sub, I'm sure it's gonna be the subject of a book. Um, Compound is the last one. This one's the easiest one to explain. So I'll just focus on this one, and I'll use that as a window for you into how these things work. Okay. The website for Compound, just for reference, is compound.finance. Um, and Compound is basically a bank. Um, it accepts deposits and it lends these deposits to others, okay? So uh, imagine the smart contract is a safe. What you're seeing here on the screen is a safe. Uh, there's some money in there, it's a deposit, a fiat, let's just say it's a USDC uh, token or a set of tokens. And now we'd like to take a loan. So Compound Finance is a bank that it's not a fractional reserve bank, not, not like the banks that we're used to. This is a bank that lends only against collateral. So normally when banks function, they, they lend, uh, if you deposit some money in there, they, make a, they will accept a, a loan application from a customer. They'll evaluate the risk and they may loan that money to the customer and not leave much money in their coffers. They, might, they don't actually hold enough capital in their coffers to repay all the deposits at any given time. It's called fractional reserve banking. In the case of Compound, it's a simpler type of bank. Remember, this is an innovation space. This stuff is new. It's going to, it's going to get to some of the more advanced stuff later. But for now, this is how it works. And it's already fascinating. So Compound needs collateral. It doesn't trust that you're going to repay the loan. It says, if, you're going, if I'm going to lend you some dollars, you need to give me some ether. Okay? So it says, please deposit some ether into my smart contract so that I may lock it so that you don't have access to your collateral. It's, I remember it's yours, but as soon as you repay your money, um, I'm going to give it back to you. So I get the money. Um, and now I have to repay it with interest in order to get my collateral back, okay? So this, because this smart contract can hold the balance, it's now able to take collateral, which may be long-term savings that I don't want to spend, and it can give me cash at low interest so that I can use this cash for something that I need. Maybe it's operating uh, working capital for my business. Uh, traders use this for margin trading. Um, there are many different things that you could do it. Who's on the other side of these dollars? Well, there's another depositor there and they're actually earning interest. So Compound is actually a bank. This already works. Compound handles about a hundred, I think over a hundred million dollars worth of deposits at the moment. So um, it's growing. hundred million dollars is not big for a bank. That's very small for a bank. Nevertheless, it's not small money. Um, so what happens when I give the dollars back? I give them back and then I can take out my collateral. This is how compound finance works. Now, I'll get to 
the real thing, like when, when folks call um, blockchain the future of finance, imagine that you had your Makia card for a car in Dubai or in the UAE, and the Makia, Makia card was issued as a token, as an ERC-20 token, and you could deposit that Makia card into the smart contract as collateral for a loan. The compound finance bank would lend you the money and keep the mortgage on your car automatically without any institution being in the way. And only when you pay back the money would you be able to take your, um, your car back. Okay, there wouldn't be any human process that would work. So today, the technology in a uh, project like compound finance gives you already the ability to take a cash loan against the car. The only thing that's missing is the ability to issue a car registration card on a public blockchain as a token and recognize that ownership of that token is ownership of the car okay so with that i would like to finish the talk and leave the floor open to questions if anybody has any ah wait i had reading for you guys so reading um this is some of the best stuff that i've been able to find um, Oh, so the card part. Okay, so somebody says, can you repeat the last part with the card? Okay, so I'm gonna repeat the last part with the card. Sorry, I'm fast forwarding it. Fast forwarding the, okay, that's the return of the loan. Okay, imagine now that your, the, Mal the Malkia card for your car is a, an ERC, 721 token like a crypto kitty okay so one Kia registration card is one token that could go in your in your wallet and this could be any wallet metamask it could be any 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 of these wallets that are my crypto uh, anything that you might have used it goes in your wallet it's compatible with the wallet people talk about interoperability and blockchains and that it's not there it's there it's all there interoperability is already here folks so you could put that 721 um, ERC 721 uh, token uh, the Mokia card in your wallet, then from your wallet, you would transfer it to, sorry, you would transfer it to, let me just, uh, I'm learning this uh, keynote. Okay, you transfer the, you transfer the ERC721 token into the smart contract that is a bank, for example, Compound Finance, and Compound Finance, it has these parameters, so it knows if it received a car, it must have a value for that car, for example. Um, and it will lend you a certain percentage of what your collateral is worth. So let's just say it, it uh, understands that your car is worth 100,000 dirhams, according to some table. It'll lend you 60% of that value, so it'll lend you 60,000 dirhams. And you'll have that 60,000. When you return it, that is when... Um, when you return the, the money, that is when the Nokia card will be released back to you automatically by the smart contract. This is how this could work. Obviously, guys, folks, just to be clear, this, is, this does not work today. This is how it could work. Um, what I just presented to you is a concept. Uh, compound I finance to, works with tokens. Yes, yes, Dr. Moore. I just want to uh, uh, just say what enables these kinds of technologies. So, uh, as you know, we have in the UAE what is called the UAE Pass now. And UAE Pass was created with all these ecosystems in mind, including uh, electronic KYC, including the, the digital issuance of documents and uh, things like uh, this registration card that you were talking about the land deed uh, the, that you can have, uh, uh, your Emirates ID, your uh, passport, your everything that can be a document that you can put as collateral or prove otherwise ownership of anything, uh, you can actually uh, issue it digitally now. Uh, by issuing it digitally, you are one step closer to enabling 
things like decentralized finance, whether it is from a company like uh, Compound or, or Token or Maker or whatever, uh, or it could be for things like issuing in the future, uh, things like uh, micro payments or uh, micro ownership in, in certain things like real estate. And instead of issuing uh, the one deed, you can issue 100 deeds for the same property or, or stake in a certain property or things like that. So you need all these documents and all these uh, uh, proof of ownerships to be digitized as a precursor to basically using them for collateral. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jan. Sorry, I got kicked off for a moment. Um, uh, what I was going to mention um, is that, yes, of course, there are um, all these types of documents issued on um, issued on blockchains. However, and you, you could correct me if I'm wrong, I, I'm not sure that they interoperate with decentralized finance. And, and I believe they're implemented on different technology that works differently than what I explained. Um, I haven't seen the technical specifications of these projects, so it's hard for me to comment further. Okay. Yeah, so the, the way it was built, it is with PKI as well. So everything is digitally signed. And it's, right now it is digitally signed by a, a cloud service that we have in the UAE, but it could be digitally signed by anything and any, any kind of uh, PKI project. Okay. Thank you. Um, so last for the reading for everybody out there, um, I tried to pick all the cherries for you. Um, first of all, uh, for an academic paper, and this isn't really a difficult paper to read, but it's, it's, it has wonderful content. Just Google uh, Professor Fabian Scher from the University of Basel. Uh, the paper is called Decentralized Finance on Blockchain and Smart Contract Based Financial Markets. Um, this paper was released, I think, on the 4th of May. It's super recent. It is a wonderful summary of the smart contracts that I mentioned in this talk and some more with very, very good plain English explanations of how they work. Um, there are newsletters. Uh, the decentralized finance, um, the De DeFi space is growing exponentially, super quickly. The pace of innovation is incredible. All this stuff is in production. Um, it's, uh, if you want to keep up, there are three newsletters that are interesting. One is called DeFi Pulse. Another called, one is called The Defiant and Build a Blockchain, okay? And these things come out either daily or weekly and they will just smother you with news, okay? Including all the hacks, everything that's happening in that space, um, all the great projects, fantastic editorials, these are by far the smartest people in the internet space these days, the folks that write for this stuff and the folks that write these projects. Um, if you wanna explore how to use these, there are super easy tools you could use. One wallet that you can use to use, um, that you can explore Compound with, is called Argent. Argent.xyz is the, the page. It used to be in uh, private beta, I'm not sure if, um, if it's publicly available yet, but if somebody's really interested, just give me a shout and I might still have a, re a referral token for you. By the way, I'm not endorsing this guy, this is beta. <laughs> I don't know how secure these things are. These are audited, they're, you know, this is, uh, but um, there is always a risk, okay? So I'm just repeating that. Zerion.io is another platform that's out there that's easy to use where you can explore these DeFi money Legos. If you're a developer and you want to see developers, uh, how people develop are developing, well, uh, eCash is something that's um, uh, one of these things that everybody always shoots for. Well, it's already here. It has been done last year. It's called XDAI and Burner Wallet. There's a gentleman named Austin Griffith, who's probably one of the most brilliant people in the, in the space. He invented something called the Burner Wallet, where your wallet is actually in your browser. It's meant for small amounts of money and it handles it on a side chain called X to die. So the Burner Wallet is one thing. Second one is F Build. This is super new, also from Austin Griffith. Um, it's a prototyping tool for building on Ethereum. Um, if you look at the videos out there, they are, uh, they are super 
um, on what this guy is able to do. Um, this stuff is truly beyond anything else out there in terms of uh, how advanced the technology is. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. I can take some questions. If there are any, I see we have a few minutes left. Um, yeah. Can you see the questions in the Q&A section, uh, Jan? Sure, let me just open it up. So there are four open ones. I answered 10 of them. <laughs> okay, uh, so first of all, how is Compound licensed? Well, Compound is a company. Um, they're, uh, they're incorporated in the, uh, in the US. Um, uh, they do have a, um, a legal counsel. His name is Jake, Jake Servinsky. Um, Jake is on Twitter. A lot of these people you can find on Twitter, guys. Um, uh, so Compound is a software company, from what I understand. The smart contract um, of the bank uh, is, uh, is controlled by that company. So they've, they've, uh, they've given it control. However, um, uh, Compound does aim toward not having true 100% control over their smart contract so that even if they're sabotaged or somehow uh, their, their um, business is made illegal for some reason, which it probably won't, uh, the smart contract will keep on functioning. So how are they licensed is very interesting. Um, it is, they're, they're definitely on the frontier of how to license a business. Next, um, okay, compound having mortgage. There is no legal status of mortgage. I was presenting a, a, uh, a concept of how it could work. Compound takes tokens as collateral. So they, they take uh, BAT, they take F, they take wrapped Bitcoin, uh, they take a whole bunch of others. You can, you can uh, find out on the website. Um, next. Uh, so this, this one is for me. Yeah, yeah, I can answer that one. So uh, uh, nothing stays the same. So uh, the credit cards also have been foresighted that they will be removed as well. Uh, digital assets are here. Uh, we, this is maybe 1.0, or what did you call it, Jan, earlier in that talk? This is like blockchain 2.1 maybe now? Uh, blockchain 201. Well, that was yeah. the lesson. Uh, but this is programmable <laughs> money. That's what it is. Yes, and, and uh, they will keep evolving. Nothing will stay the same. Even uh, uh, right now, we have this brilliant idea of, of digital assets with Bitcoin. But God knows down the, the road, maybe one year, two years, three years from now, God knows what other technology or, or concept even will come up uh, soon. Even uh, cars and parkings and all the stuff will be gone. And you can see all these futures predicting this kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the need right now for cars with this COVID situation is decreasing day by day and you'll see more uh, on us on, on things like uh, shared drives, shared resources and things like that. So that's my answer. Okay, um, so next question. Uh, we have uh, to get proper education or certification. Okay, guys, this is like the internet in the mid 90s. There is nobody who does certifications for this better than you. Um, I gave you what you have on the screen here is a good primer. Follow that. Follow the people on Twitter. This is all self-taught. This is how innovation is done. It's not taught in a school. Um, it's self-taught. Um, so there is no certification I would recommend apart from reading, reading these, these types of sources, doing your own research. Uh, when, it, when it comes to degrees um, and that kind of stuff. Next sorry, question. I, what if the sorry, borrower I, doesn't return the money? How can they force taking, uh, how can they force taking the car in this example? Okay, well, if this was implemented, um, there would need to be legal provisions made for selling the car. So there would have to be, um, if we were to do this as a real type of implementation, um, we would have a service economy where there would be um, services that would sell the car in the name of the, uh, the, the, the smart contract to receive a payment. Then the payment would be paid into the smart contract in lieu of the car, repay the loan, yeah? And the car's, uh, the car's ownership would be released by the smart contract. So the law would have to support this, okay? That's a very big caveat. It's a big if. Um, I don't know if it's ha happening anywhere in the, uh, in the world right now. However, in theory, it's already doable today, if, if the law allowed it. Um, last question, is there a real future for private blockchains? 
Um, taking into account what I explained about how public blockchains work and that they handle money uh, and in order for them to, the smart contracts to, to be unique or to have a function that's different than databases, than cloud databases, it's not very easy to um, come up with um, ways that a private blockchain could be used in such a way. Um, uh, there's, there are some projects out there that um, build consortiums of companies, say for example, for bank uh, growth settlements between banks, between different countries. Uh, there may be um, use cases like that, that that may warrant the use of a private blockchain um, because uh, national level trust is something that doesn't exist. Countries don't necessarily trust each other um, because there are world courts or global courts aren't very effective. So there may be, uh, there may be a way for, for these to work and, and there are such projects. However, um, uh, most of the projects out there that are on a private blockchain, if you implemented them on a private, on a, on a database, on a cloud database with the security that's afforded by cloud databases, um, they wouldn't necessarily be much different. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, I think we're running out of time, uh, Jan. Thank you very much, very insightful. And uh, thank you for the reading list. We actually in the Blockchain Center usually have homework uh, at the end of each session. <laughs> so good uh, this time as well. We're keeping that tradition going by giving everyone homeworks as well to do. And uh, we promise you as Blockchain Center as well to, to come back with the more interesting topics. And if you guys are interested in digging deep into whichever aspect of blockchain technology, please let us know and uh, we will uh, uh, give you more in-depth looks at these technologies. Uh, thank you, Jan, very much. It's a very insightful lecture. And thank you, Robert, for attending as well. And thank you for signing the MOU with us. And uh, I leave the floor to you, Cherry, to uh, finish up. Yes, uh, so thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank Jan. I'd like to thank Dr. Marwan and Robert uh, for the amazing session. And I'd like to thank all our attendees. Um, so thank you for joining us today. If you have any more questions, uh, please let us know or, or feel, feel free to reach out to us. We'll try and answer them offline. And also uh, for future sessions, um, I'd like to invite you to follow us on our social media channels. This is where we announce all our sessions. And uh, I think that's all for today. And um, wish you a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Bye-bye.